Hello, how are you? This is uh, Diego Vigil, the author of uh, the new second edition of uh, the Chicano High Schoolers in the Changing Los Angeles. Initially, the first, the name for the first edition was Personas Mexicanas, and I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, here's, how do I move these slides? I'm trying to figure, there I go. There's a, the title of the new book and it, uh, next page, how do I, how you, how you do it here? Then? Okay, there it is. Initially it was part of the George and Louise Spindler series on educational anthropology. They made uh, at least three or four dozen books available from different experts on educational issues. And I'm just uh, one of many that put this together about Mexican-American students, uh, high school students in particular. Next, just, throw, it's just uh, because Gil and I come from the same school, he goes first. So we have to have a photograph there. Anyway, I used to teach public school back in the 1960s. And I was very fortunate to teach elementary, junior high, and high school, all levels in later community college, and then of course the university. So I've been involved in educational research for quite a long time, uh, and also in participation as a teacher in observing classrooms, uh, lecturing to Abbott on a regular, regular basis. Next, there's uh, the name of the publisher, and I'm gonna give you this uh, PowerPoint and for those people who are viewing or are interested, this is the publisher that the book, that's the second edition, that's only about $20. As, as academic books go, go, that's cheap. But uh, you guys decide if you want to find out more about it. Anyway, next slide. Here's uh, my uh, overall photograph of uh, different murals that I've, in neighborhoods that I've worked in in, uh, in Los Angeles, East LA in particular. Uh, the one on the left, of course, is Cholo Mural. The one on the right is Father Boyle and uh, a military man, and of course, the famous Dr. King. Uh, and that, our mural, those are murals spewed all over East LA. And this is sort of captures my focus, which is like, what time, place, and people are we talking about? When we look at different educational uh, places and educational experiences from different age groups. Next. Here's uh, the time factor that's very interesting. These are cholos from the 1960s. The guy in the extreme right, you can notice it that carefully, but he has a hairnet on. At that time, they used to wear uh, hairnets to get their hair down, you know, get their hair flat and, and, and uh, bald. But that, I'll show you some other photos later of some of the, uh, of, of the other individuals that I've gotten to know. This, uh, the time is important because it reflects the economy, the social habits of the people, political habits and so on. Next, this is uh, the neighborhoods that I am familiar with in Greater East LA. This one is a particular, particularly backward rural enclave. And it's only about uh, a block or two from Holland back junior high, two or three blocks from Roosevelt High School, two major schools of the East LA area. And this is like called Fickett's Hollow. That was the name of the barrio. And uh, you can't notice it that, that much, but in some areas, if you look carefully, carefully, the houses have like an outhouse right next to it and, and dirt roads. And this is like the 19, early 1940s when World War II started. Next, the people, different backgrounds. You've already gotten a taste of that with some of the photographs that I've shown you. And then here we have uh, a young uh, Sapotec from Oaxaca and moved in to LA to work in some of the uh, low income jobs and with his wife in an apartment in a housing project in East Los Angeles. So the people, all kinds of variations in that uh, issue. Next, 
Here's a quotation from uh, George Spindler. Uh, he and his wife did extensive work in uh, educational anthropology. And here he points out one of the major uh, research issues is like how when people come to a, a new country and they get into their enduring past identity, as they get familiar with the present influences and then the stress between the two, that's when you get cultural marginality, choloization, uh, all kinds of other psychological and educational issues that spring from identity crises, especially if schools are teaching only one kind of culture, Anglo culture, and not incorporating Mexican and Spanish speaking culture in order to move the children little by little into the world uh, of English speaking Anglos. Next, this is the first uh, study that I conducted. I compared two schools, urban, suburban, and then this tells you simple little facts, population, how it changed from 1974 to 88. That's my first uh, two uh, period study, and it shows you the percentage of Mexicans in the, in the areas, uh, and also how they've changed, especially in the suburban area. It went from uh, uh, 18%, no, actually, uh, what was it, 4% uh, to 20% in a matter of uh, 15, 20 years. Next, this is another thing showing the actual makeup of the high school. Uh, giving you the percentage of the Mexican students there. And in the case of the Anglo students in suburbia, uh, suburban schools, there were only 5% uh, born in Mexico. So you could see the major contrast between urban, suburban areas. That was my first study. Go ahead. Now I'm looking, when I think of uh, acculturation, I think of uh, the cultural styles that emerge from first to third, fourth generation uh, Spanish speaking, Spanish surname children. And then, of course, I get into the spectrum of your Mexicanness and your Angloness in terms of your values, also your language ability, if you speak Spanish or not, uh, and if you were born in a, a Spanish speaking country. And of course, the bilingual biculturals are the ones who successfully navigate the Mexican to Anglo worlds from second, third generations on in those who fail and don't make the journey and become cultural marginals. And they don't necessarily become gang members. They become like, you know, part of a different uh, countercultural group or subcultural group. Uh, and I'll cite some of those with photographs shortly. Next. That's a, a more specific uh, diagram showing the Anglo-urban suburban split for the students in the top from 74 to 88 and in the bottom from 74 to 88, given the, uh, their, you know, region and, and area and their location. This gives you an idea of how the spectrum back in the early 1940 study, 1974 study was much wider. The Mexicans were more recent immigrants to one extreme, Hortensia and Matilda represent those students. And then Vicente and Alberto represent the very anglicized students in the urban area. They don't speak much Spanish, just a sketchy kind of Spanish here and there. And they're usually third generation. This is back in 74. In 88, it's changed. Notice the spectrum has gone, gotten smaller. Mexicans are much more uh, closer to the second generation or first that arrived maybe at the age of four or five in what we call the 1.5 generation. And then, of course, uh, the ones in the middle are the marginals between Mexican and Anglo culture. And then, of course, in the extreme right, the 1988 uh, urban group they're less anglicized. They're second generation mostly. So you get a variation in just that, uh, in those two places in just that short time period. And in the bottom uh, uh, section, we have the uh, suburban students. Again, 
the spectrum is much wider in 1974. And then there are a lot of stories from the parents, it's from the children to a degree about racism, about discrimination, about separate and unequal housing, things that were reflective of the reality. Now, that reality didn't continue to exist in 1988. That's why the spectrum is shorter. They're much more familiar with Anglo culture. Next. Here's the, the notion I'm trying to get across. Adaptation and acculturation are very shaky in some instances for individuals that don't know how to uh, fashion a strategy and for schools who don't know how to integrate uh, culturally different students and with the racism and all the other uh, historical practices about where you live, where you go to the restroom, where you go to the rest restaurant or the swimming pool, all that discriminatory separate separate uh, institutions uh, reality. But here I talk about how cultures change over a period of two or three generations. Mexican culture would be considered the first uh, subculture. And in the process of them getting anglicized and familiar with an Anglo-American world, they become marginals in the sense of they become solo from the Cholo. The Cholo subculture refers to the street gang population, but it goes back three or 400 years in Latin America to describe the population that was between the Indian, pop, Indian way of speaking and acting and the Spanish way of speaking and acting. So we just change it and make it Mexican Anglo instead of Indian Spanish. But the point is here that there are cultural marginals. They come from being lost between two cultures. In fact, Cholo derives from the word solo. You're solo, they're marginal, you're like lost. You're not, you don't belong to this group, you don't belong to that group. And that goes back deep, four or 500 years. Again, part of the Indian experience is one of choloization, marginalization, and the effort to become part of the dominant culture. Okay, next. Now, this is a more up-to-date gathering of information for you to get a feeling for changes that have occurred in both urban suburban areas since 1974. I went back in 2000 and also 2017, and I picked up basic demographic information about the number of uh, people in the area, the number of Mexicans, the incomes of the populations as you see that, that they change both in urban and suburban area. And urban has gone from what, 7,000 plus a year to 42,000 a year. A major increase, but still lags way behind uh, the suburban area as you can see just below it. 1974 to 2017, it gives you a feel. So I interview students from not only 74, 75, those were very in-depth and a lot of uh, demographic information. But then I interview students from 19, uh, 2017, 2019. And then the bottom here, these photographs kind of block it off. But can we move that slide up a little bit? Maybe, no, I guess not. Uh, the population of a uh, upscale suburban area. I decided to include, it was just an accidental serendipity thing. Uh, I had a student from many years ago at a community college that was working at a high school in an upscale suburban area, close to the greater East LA uh, locations where the two urban suburban campuses are located. And I asked them to do some research and asked for his permission to assist me in doing research at the school. And I was able to gather information to give you a contrast for a, an upscale suburban area as opposed to the one I used in 74, 88 and 2017, the one that's like a working class suburban area. And the urban area, of course, is uh, the barrio of East LA. And that one there, uh, you can see the population is only 58,000. Uh, only 12% are of the population is Mexican. And just below that, you can't see it here, but the uh, income is about, uh, I think, close to 90,000, 94,000. 
a contrast between 42,000, 63,000, and 30,000 more. And again, this is an area that's primarily Chinese, small percentage of Mexicans there, and the Mexicans there are at least second, third, third generation, a few first generations, but very uh, well healed, well off Mexican immigrants. They come with an education, they come with certain uh, business skills, and they're able to parlay that background into very successful uh, adjustment to the United States in uh, an up, up, upscale area. Next, these are some of the photographs. This is the Urban 74. Go ahead, we're gonna go through these rather quickly. How many more minutes do we have, Rachel? You're at 20 minutes now, so. Uh, we got about 10 more minutes. Yes. Or maybe less after we took so long to start. This is a photograph of my brother-in-law and sister-in-law when they were just boyfriend and girlfriend at the Urban High School. And they just happened to be at that school by coincidence. So I took their photograph and threw them on my first edition of the book. Next. Here are the cholos from the 19, early 1970s. Again, the style, the hair is just a little long, maybe an inch or two long. And then they love to wear t-shirts and sweaters at that era. That was in the khakis. That was the style of that time. Okay, that was the cultural marginals. These are back, go back to the, the cholos, please. Oh, we, once we move forward, that's it, Never mind. These, okay, they're the cholos. Okay, next, next, wait for me to see. Next. These guys are uh, surfers at the Urban High School in 1988. Again, the style uh, and the clothes are very much surfer, Chicano style, but nevertheless, you get a lot of cultural styles in the variation that I've gathered from the, the two schools over a period of time and uh, adding the upscale suburban school later. Next, these are cha-chas from the late 1988 uh, urban area. And cha-cha, some of you are familiar with that. If you went to that period in the 1980s, where it's Mexican immigrants trying to show that they are up to date with the fashions and the style of more anglicized and American uh, populations. So they like to get hair fuzzy and I'll show you another photograph next. This is a young man from the same era. Again, the, uh, the hairdo is more like uh, James Dean or Tony Curtis era, but that was the cha-chas. And that only lasted for the 80s. And after that, things went back, people assimilated or actually became very, very uh, talented and adept bilingual biculturals. Which, was, which is one of the main findings of my, uh, of my book and the fact that educational performance is now to this, now it's shown that if you get bilingual, bicultural education, a sense of identity that's solid, you escape the worst effects of marginalization and you're able to make the leap and the transition into Anglo culture. This is the main emphasis for these students that are able, are able to at least be comfortable and feel uh, okay about their identity and the, the fact that they rely mostly on Spanish. I'm a strict advocate for all students, Spanish speakers, Korean speakers, Chinese, to speak the other language and don't be like the generation of the 19th, 20th century, 20th century, early 20th century, allowing yourself to be forced into an American English only uh, language. I'm very much an advocate of that. And I appreciate very much that educational leaders and other teachers are doing the same thing, at least at these two schools. Next, obviously these guys are uh, into heavy metal, I imagine. I don't know, this is again, the Garfield School from 88. This is a style you pick up there. So you have cholos, a lot of surfers, as well as, uh, uh, gang members, I mean, in, in surfers, okay? Next, here are crypto cholos. What the hell is a crypto cholo? Crypto cholos are, are we're told, the new principal of this school, this is 88, 
decided he's not going to allow cholos to dress a certain way on campus. They have to camouflage himself and dress like something else. And in fact, he did everything he possibly could to uh, discourage them from going to school there. And like, for instance, they had a policy that if you show, don't show up the first day of school, you have to go to another high school down the street, which is usually a high school that's their, their, their rival. But this is an example of students adjusting to the demands of the administration. But since I'm a cholo, it's easy for me to hear. Once you're a cholo, you can tell a cholo. Right, Gil? All right, next. Here are some cholos. These are obvious. The shirts, the t-shirts. We have a couple of Vietnamese guys here. And then later we'll show you a photograph of a black gang and a black group that had a wedding and it's a mixed group of blacks and, and Latinos. This is a, a, a housing project, a place where I did an in-depth study on family life, something different than education. But nevertheless, these are the guys I get to know. And this guy and left, second from the left is an older uh, children. He's like in his late 30s. Uh, but he's with hanging out with the guys in the early 20s. And the younger guys often refer to these cholos as dinosaurs because they're like still hanging around with the guys and going down to the audio to pick up a couple of guys to help them in a fight that started at some other audio uh, nearby. Next. Just the working class girls in suburban area in 74. Now we get the working class girls in a little sports club, 74. One of the teachers who uh, aided me, by the way, that's one of the techniques I use when I get entree into any of the schools. I get to know teachers, I get to know counselors, I get to know principals, and I get entree and they let me do whatever I want. And of course, they have a lot of confidence and what I write, I don't publicize the name of the school. I keep it uh, uh, between us two. Next. Again, suburban school in 88. Mexican girl. Next. Mexican and Anglo girlfriend. In the background, you see an Anglo and Mexican uh, male friends. Suburban area in 88. Yes. Next. Now here's a kicker. Cholos of late 60s, early 70s in suburban area. Long hair. They still cling on to the Pendleton shirts. They still have the khakis. And it's a different suburban cholo style than what I showed you a few minutes ago for the urban one. So among all the students that I random sampled, of course, I have to get Mexicans to get Anglo. And then I get marginals in the middle. Sometimes the marginals are not gang members, especially in 2017 and 2018. Schools have been effective at eliminating students who want to appear to be dressing and acting like gang members. So gang members are all DL, down low. These guys are out and open when the time when they weren't uh, setting up school restrictions and standards about them. One of the good things about the suburban school, they had a real, uh, really good principal, poor white guy who grew up knocking around himself, kind of tough guy himself. And he set up a special little group for the gang kids, for them to hang around. And they even had their own little uh, boys console where they had uh, power to govern and make rules and laws and different, have different uh, events on campus. That was his effort and it succeeded quite greatly to co-op marginals because he had grown up as a marginal. Next. This is a kid that's just a regular suburban uh, Chicano. Next. These are some of the students from Crosstown High School and I won't tell you the name, but there are two high schools in East LA I did my research in one of the main ones. This one's another main one, which I also did a lot of work in, but not anywhere as extensively as I did in the 74, 88, and 17, 19, 
urban one. Yeah, next. I can't tell you what this guy he's living is. He's just a gang member. You can see with the tattoos. Uh, and also he's giving the sign of the name of the barrio Cuatro Flats, 4th Street Flats, near the Pico Union, uh, Pico Gardens Housing Project. And that's a parking lot in the same area. Uh, but he's a very deeply involved gang member. Uh, serious look, serious business. Yes, next. Here's all the students from the projects at Roosevelt High. They all hang out together for, for lunch. They're from the projects and it's, believe it or not, they, they have to explain their existence to people sometimes because often they're uh, mistaken for a gang member because they're from the housing projects. But most of them are not in a gang, but they hang out together nevertheless and they feel a little bit more sense of camaraderie among people from their own background. Yes, next. Here's the black guy I told you about, who's uh, my research assistant. He was a deeply involved member of the gang of the area, Quattro Flats. In fact, he did 10 years in San Quentin for an incident that, well, I won't elaborate. And then on the left with the brown, uh, the white sweater is my uh, research assistant at USC, Karen Stellwag, and she's a filmmaker. And then a guy on the right worked for Senator Hayden when he was a politician in LA. He's the guy that went to that school and he graduated and he went to college at Cal State Los Angeles, became a political representative for one of the top politicians in the area. Next. Okay. Here's high school interactions. Okay, one of the problems with the generic at risk child, yeah. There are too many strategies. There's just a couple that you got to focus on. One is respect, showing respect for some of the kids that come from these backgrounds. That goes a long way. And they say they're from the projects. You give them that much more respect, respect they, I mean, do wonders for you. Yes, next. A balanced strategy is one that I emphasize for all my students, not just the street gang members that I know quite a bit about, but all students, the ones that are surfers, ones that are uh, Ivy Leaguers, ones that are heavy metal, and I try to get close to all of them and find out what their educational experiences are. One of the things that I found with most of the individuals in the later years, 2017, 2019, because of the cultural enrichment programs and the fact that they had bilingual education programs and they had avid uh, learning kinds of uh, activities that showed that they were trying to make a different approach, uh, take a different approach to educating and reaching the children. And I, I strongly believe that bilingual bicultural education, as I've already mentioned, is working rather successfully. The students are coming out now a lot more confident and are doing well, not only in high school, but also in college the membership in college, the percentage of increase in college has gone phenomenal, become phenomenal. Uh, next, here's my research assistant. Next, oh, next, go, go back to that. Yeah, here we are talking about prevention, intervention, suppression, and of course school, I mean, if you don't get them at Head Start, or kindergarten, you're going to lose them, and pretty soon they're going to be in the remedial class in second and third grades. And fortunately, some of the kids by nine or 10, they started identifying with the street gang element. Although the ones in 2008, 2017, and 19 were not doing much of that because the school principal and other authority, law enforcement among, among others, were coming down on them getting rid of dressing this way, getting, and then plus gang members are wising up in a sense of like all their relatives, all their friends were in jail. And I mean, doing 10, 15 years, not just, you know, two or three months or a couple of years. So that was enough of a lesson where they, like I said, DL, down low. If they're gonna be a gang member, they're gonna get involved. Don't bring a lot of attention to yourself if you can help it. 
But anyway, that's more or less the new book, uh, Chicano High Schoolers in a Changing LA. Uh, I'll give you this copy. I don't know if you could use it. Or you're, gonna, you're gonna throw it away. But just for the address of the new publisher, he's a guy out of Ohio that does uh, second editions. Any questions, Gil? Now that I get to see a different photograph of you, the other one looked like you were having too good a time. Okay, well, now we're going to hear, thank you so much, Professor Vigil, for those comments on your book. And now we're going to have some commentary from Professor Gilberto Q. Conchas, who is the Wayne K. and Anita Wolf Akoy Endowed Professor of Education at Penn State uh, University. He, before that, taught here at UC Irvine. Um, and he is a prolific author himself. And we're very pleased that he'll be doing a book talk on his own. Uh, book, The Chicana OX Dream, Hope, Resistance, and Educational Success, and that will be taking place at noon on April 6th, so keep an eye out for that. Um, Gil, would you like to go ahead and, and get started? Uh, thank you, Rachel. It's great seeing everyone. Diego, good to see you. Uh, um, Diego Vigil's Chicano High Schoolers in a Changing Los Angeles is a timely book that concentrates on the educational experiences of Mexican-American youth, from recent immigrants to those that have been in the United States for generations. The book astutely seeks to unravel the relationship between acculturation and school success by offering a holistic and longitudinal approach in three neighborhood contexts and four time periods that span over 50 years. As Diego mentioned, from 1974, to 2019, almost 50 years from the Vietnam War to the current 19 pandemic. Let me begin by offering uh, a few comments on, on the book. First, like his earlier work on urban youth gang subcultures, the book presents a keen examination of youth identity formation and cultural transition. Vigil provides a provocative account of the culturation and schooling achievement of four generation of Chicano students and discovers that despite students' common backgrounds, they portray distinct cultural orientations. The book reveals the range of multiple identities Chicano youth maintain as they navigate between schools and their urban enclaves. So Vigil depicts not a generic Chicano youth population, but a diverse and complex one. Second, methodologically, the Hill's research spans 50 years and combines ethnography and statistical analysis. He compares the cultural and academic experiences of 1974 and 1988 and 2007 and 2019 cohorts of Chicano students attending urban and suburban high schools in the greater Los Angeles era. Combining correlation analysis and in-depth qualitative thumbnail sketches of young people's lives, Vigil develops an acculturation scale that highlights the cultural and generational variance among, among Chicano students. More specifically, Vigil's acculturation spectrum classifies youth in terms of whether they are Mexican-oriented, intermediate, or Anglo-oriented. A stable ethnic and cultural identity as Diego has demonstrated in his uh, PowerPoint, singled positive school outcomes for many of these urban youth. So similar to his previous work, student voices are at the center of his analysis. Third, theoretically, Vigil's analysis is a larger debate about the role of social structure and culture in shaping student experiences. Vigil calls for a more holistic approach that takes into consideration the reflexive nature of culturalist and structuralist viewpoints. He proposes a rather uh, a model, theoretical model that places an individual's persona and motivation as a means to explain school performance. He coins the term personas mexicanas 
as a term to encompass the multiple identities individuals embrace that lead to their academic failure or academic success. In this regard, persona mexicana becomes the mediating force between structure and culture. I believe that the personas mexicana framework really represents that interlocking process of time, place, and people. An individual's persona mexicana dictates various schooling experiences across time, such as the economic, social, and political context. Place, such as the changing realities of neighborhoods and schools, and people, such as individual expectations, interpretations, and actions. Student agency as viewed through the Personas Mexicanas framework involves Chicano youth's comfort level with their ethnic identity and cultural surroundings. Vigil's examination represents a significant theoretical advancement in assessing ethnic identity among Chicano youth and the connection to the school context. The book briefly discusses macro changes at the government level, meso practices at the school and community level, and micro dynamics in the classroom. The book locates various school programs, such as New Horizons, and advancement via individual determination, more commonly known as AVID, that embrace ethnic diversity and the construction of school success. Vigil introduces these programs as possible educational policy initiatives and calls for a thorough assessment of how these initiatives affect acculturation and school performance. By doing so, we are able to devise policy and practice designed to impact the largest minoritized group in California, a population constantly facing changes. Finally, Chicano high schoolers in a change in Los Angeles advances the research literature on ethnic incorporation and social mobility among the fastest growing ethno-racial ethno population in the United States. As new waves of Latinx immigrant labor, labor enters the US to meet the enormous demands of a global economy, the book suggests that an examination of the Chicano experience carries profound implications. The diversity of cultural styles, languages, and ethnic identities within the Chicano population needs to be recognized with such an analysis. Perhaps Vigil's greatest contribution is his sensitivity concerning the plight of marginalized Chicano youth in the American system. He depicts the nuance, fluidity, range of Chicano schooling experiences over a remarkable 50 year span. Vigil reminds us of the importance of not treating the Mexican descent population as a monolithic entity, but as a complex and a diverse one with special concerns. In closing, and not to give my friend Diego a big head. Vigil is not only an outstanding scholar as evidenced by his many books, but also an outstanding mentor and friend. I truly consider Professor Vigil one of the foremost educational anthropologists of our era, alongside George and Louis Spindler, Margaret Mead, Stacy J. Lee and Marcelo Suarez Orozco. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Gonchez. Uh, what a wonderful tribute both to the book and to Professor Vigi. And now, uh, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A uh, function. And Elizabeth Schatz Cordero, my wonderful research assistant who's been helping us with this book talk series, will then pose those questions to our uh, panelists. Um, as we wait for your questions, I have um, one of my, unless of course, Professor Conscious, you wanna to respond to the commentary. Otherwise I'll go ahead and pose my question.
Okay, you do not want to respond to the commentary? Diego, that's for you. You need I, to unmute your, there you go. Do you I, want to respond? I appreciate the, <laughs> the words of Professor uh, Conchas as, as, our, as we have many conversations and I have to uh, admit that there are many times that he has uh, a lot different insights that I do, even though I did teach public school for many years. Uh, and the fact that he's a deeply involved and prolific author on public school and educational issues, his words hit me with a lot of satisfaction. Very happy to know that a scholar of his caliber appreciates uh, the work that I do. And uh, essentially, this whole educational trajectory is a work in progress. We have to do, and, and, uh, Manuel Ramirez back in the 1960s told us that we have to do studies in different neighborhoods, in different uh, generations, in order to get a feel for all the educational and other social issues that uh, our population has experienced and is experiencing and how they uh, might be uh, integrated into a new educational philosophy to sort of get them to be, to reach their potential. And uh, I, I have no uh, reservations about if we take this path that I suggested seems to be working, we're gonna be in a lot better shape and we're gonna have a hell of a lot less kids that are marginal and gang members. They'll have a lot, a lot better feelings about themselves. But anyway, I appreciate your words, Gil. And so I, I think while we wait for questions from the audience, the first question that I wanted to ask you about related to your, your observation that there was less of a gang presence later in the later years of your study, but we hear a lot about the school to prison pipeline. And so one question is, is it because the schools are succeeding that we see less of a presence or is it because these students are getting pushed out through the school to prison pipeline, which really came about with zero tolerance policies during the decades that you were studying. So it was a change in school culture that right. happened while you were doing your work. Right. So the question is what? What do you think about the school to prison pipeline and the role oh, that it well, played? Because, you know, you say that you didn't see as much of a gang presence, and that could be because everybody was doing right. better, but it could also be because those people got pushed out of the schools. Yeah, your question is such an obvious one. I should have been alerted to answering it properly. I just I kind of missed the drift of the point. Yes, during the time of the uh, 90s and 2000 era as uh, hard on crime, uh, the STEP Act, gang injunctions and certain specific laws that were aimed to keep gangs from joining other groups like themselves and keep, keep them from doing anything that they would, uh, it would be charted as a group thing rather than just a community thing. And uh, during that time, when all the prisons were like full of gang members, it was like that was their, that was their, end, uh, their ending to go to prison, to spend quite a bit of time there. And then later in life, they realized, as I pointed out, their uh, DL down low because they, you know, older gang members are telling them, this is not paying off. You know, this is not, uh, I mean, it sounds good for your prestige and your image at first, but over the long haul, you're not gonna help yourself any by being in prison. And this information and feedback has fortunately received enough, uh, has been registered with enough gang members that has affected their choices. Before it used to be, I want to be for my audio no matter what, but uh, now we have other options. The fact that schools are now making an effort with prevention and intervention. And up to the 1990s, the main approach to the society was to put them all in prison, you know, punishment, 
uh, no uh, intervention, no prevention. Uh, but now uh, there's a combination of approaches. Uh, you know, the jelly one has worked only to a certain extent, but they kept enough of this generation to continue to break laws and do things and uh, bring a public uh, police attention to their activities. Anyway, yeah, you're ab absolutely correct. It made a hell of a difference. Just put them all in jail. That's the solution to the problem. I think we we have something in the in the chat function. Yep. Um, um, I can read that. Um, this question is. If more gang members are operating on the down low in schools, has their level of involvement also changed since the 1980s? Yes, it has, but in a different way. Unfortunately, one of the ways that has changed is business opportunities to become more lucrative for street gang members, not just drug trafficking, but taxing. Taxing is something new that I didn't really uh, experience in my earlier years as a gang researcher. And what it comes down to is in, an individual in a particular neighborhood, gang member, he decides he's gonna charge anybody who sells drugs in the area, certain percentage, or if they do other work in the area that they make money from, uh, selling goods, let's say stolen goods. So they're gonna get a piece of the action with this taxes. So taxes and drug sales, and other kinds of uh, illicit activities are, are part of the, uh, the new gang uh, re re reactions to a hard, a hard law enforcement point, point of view. But again, they're not as prominent as they were back in my earlier uh, decades. I mean, in, in the schools. And, you know, just building on this, I think one thing we see now is a gender gap in educational performance among uh, Chicano students. And if these bicultural, bilingual strategies are working, why do they work so differently for boys and girls? We're really seeing that boys are not achieving at the same level and going on to college and advanced education as, as females are. So why, why do you think that gender gap has emerged? That's the $64,000 question. Why is it that males are not uh, improving or changing or benefiting from any kinds of educational adjustments or programs? Uh, I think the male, edu edu the male student has other kinds of issues and problems, especially growing up in poverty, growing up in uh, a need to show that he's a macho, that he's a real man, especially under adverse conditions where uh, individuals are always challenged in terms of their uh, physicality and their ability to fight. So I think that that's part of it. But the other part of it is that we haven't come up, like I said, the $64,000 question, we haven't come up with a good strategy they would be able to integrate the male. I'm, I came up from a, a physical uh, boxing upbringing with a Catholic church. We had boxing and that helped let us let steam off and then we learned how to defend ourselves. And then everybody felt like, you know, like they didn't have to fight because they I knew how to box already. They felt like they accomplished something. But we need more uh, activities like that. I mean, we don't have, uh, the CYO anymore, like this Catholic Youth Organization that once existed throughout uh, Los Angeles. Now they're just a skeletal forms of certain kinds of uh, groups like that. Uh, and the females are just jumping at the chance. And well, for one thing, females have probably been neglected too long and the doors open, a few little uh, tidbits of encouragement and remedial and uh, uh, looks from teachers that show that you know you are intelligent, you can do well if you want to, and they just take off. So uh, the males are gonna, we're gonna have to come up with another strategy to include the males. Physical activity is good, boxing is good, you know, all that stuff, but that's not, of course, the panacea. 
Professor Conscious, I don't know if you want to address that question. Uh, my, we have five minutes. Can I ask Diego a question? Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm interested, Diego, how have you expanded upon your work in education and what, what work are you currently doing? Thank you very much, Gil. I always wanted to be put on the spot. <laughs> right now, I'm working on uh, another area altogether, it's doing the same issue, but trying to figure out ways to write creatively. I have a couple of books. I have one book that I finished about a youngster and his girlfriend and his mother, blah, 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 capturing the dynamics of an individual that wants to show his girlfriend and mother that he's tough and he can handle the realities and pressures of the street life, but not to be stupid about it and winding up going to jail for quite a long time. So right now, I'm not working on anything academic uh, except a couple of articles dealing with my mentor, Joan Moore, who taught me a hell of a lot about gangs and you're familiar with her work. Uh, but creative writing is what I'm trying to get into, if I get into that. And I would love to incorporate in the creative writing approach that I'm hoping to take educational issues different problems in schools, teachers who don't care, or uh, students who've given up trying, just like, oh, I'm too dumb, I, I can't do this. And plus, students that identify more with the gang members, and they're their pals for behavior. They want to get guidance from gang members about how to behave, which is detrimental, and how to teach that that is not doing them any good. It's going to take, again, certain creative uh, approaches. There's a lot of people out there doing it now. A lot of former gang members that have wised up and they don't want other gang members like themselves to follow that uh, negative path. So, and creative writings where, where we're trying to go with those stories. Well, that is really interesting. It's a, a very interesting transition of your own. Um, speaking of trajectories and transitions, um, what I wanted to do was to thank everybody for coming today. And before we close, just acknowledge some of the people who've made this event possible and tell you about our upcoming, so a couple of upcoming events. So I wanted to thank um, Interim Dean Bryant Garth and Acting Dean Chris Whitehawk here at UCI School of Law for their support. Um, I also wanted to thank Ajay Marotra at the American Bar Foundation for their support. I also want to express my appreciation to Elizabeth Schatz Cordero, my research assistant who works with me and Robbie Kadri of the UCI Law Centers for his efforts to make sure that we always have a, a quality program. Of course, I want to acknowledge our deep gratitude to our presenter, Professor Vigil and our commentator, Professor Conscious, for these enlightening remarks. All of you for being here. We hope you will join us at future events. Our next event will be on March 16th, also a Wednesday at 12 noon. And we'll be hearing from Benjamin Marquez on the politics of patronage. His book explores with original archival research the ways in which the philanthropy that supported the creation of the Mexican-American Legal Defense and Education Fund also dramatically altered its agenda and the kinds of reform activities it pursued. So it's a really fascinating book. I hope you'll join us. And then as I mentioned, Professor Conchas is going to be back on April 6th for a talk about his own book. And I'll just hold it up since we have the cover of the other book. And it's the Chicana OX uh, Dream, and it is co-authored with Nancy Acevedo, and it really looks at strategies for educational success. So if you were interested in learning more about how students navigate these complex structures while staying true to their cultural identities, this will be a wonderful additional talk for you to attend on Wednesday, April 6th at 12 noon. And so with that, Thank you so much for being a part of the hey, series. Can I interrupt you for a minute? Yes. yes. Is there any way that we can make sure that the address of the publisher 
is left on the power program for them, for anybody to to look up the name and address of the public, or is that something that's separate? Um, well, I think the PowerPoint we record... program, you know, the first image. Oh yes. Well, we do record the sessions, and then anyone who registered will good, get good. the recording. So okay. thank you for asking about Excellent. that, and and I think that that should be very possible. And you know, I I was able to get my copy. It's got all my stickies from reading the book, so I enjoyed it, and I I'm sure all of you will as well. I love the photos, by the way. Thank so, you. Let me know if you need any more books. I'll be happy. To <laughs> I got a copy from the library. Page. Um, okay. so yeah, so thank you everyone so much for joining us thank today. Thank you very much, all of you, for your participation. I appreciate it. Yield, especially you. We'll call each other later, right? <laughs> okay, all right.